The Gospel of John, the 17th chapter, beginning with the first verse. This is many times referred to as Jesus' high priestly prayer. Shortly before he went to the cross, he has his disciples together for one last time. And he gets on his knees and he prays these words. Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was." I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them, and they received them, and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them. And not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who believe in me through their words, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Well, this past week, how many of you ate Turkey. Let's see your hands. Everybody that ate turkey. Okay. Okay. You know, I, we ate turkey last uh, Thursday, and then last night I watched an Aggie ball game. How many of y'all saw the game? Let's see your hands. Yeah. Wow. S- history was made last night. It wasn't pretty, but it came out okay. But uh, the thing is, got me to thinking about turkeys. And uh, the thing is, whenever I was at A&M, they called the guys that messed up gobblers. Did you know that? 
If somebody, uh, you know, like whenever we were, they were making us get in, learn how to stay coordinated and march and all that stuff. The guy that whenever everybody else did a left face, they did the right face. Those guys were called gobblers. Those guys that messed everything up for everybody else. Uh, guys that just didn't quite, weren't able to get it together. They called them gobblers. And there's another derogatory word that we use for people sometimes, and that's the word turkey, isn't it? Now, I don't know how many times have you, I don't know, maybe you've been called a turkey. Maybe you've called someone a turkey, but uh, let's say you turkey, you know. But uh, the thing is, the definition of a turkey using that definition is someone who doesn't remotely fill the bill. Someone who just seems to be in the wrong place, the wrong time. Uh, somebody who just can't get it right. A person who seems to be a square peg trying to fit into a round hole. That's basically a turkey. And here in this passage, we see Jesus praying for his disciples and uh, he knows he's heading for certain death at Jerusalem. His time is near. And his disciples know it also. And he has grown to love this band of men. He has poured himself into them. And they have given themselves to him. And they have been through a lot together. They've shared a lot of meals They've shared a lot of ministry. They've shared a lot of criticism. They've shared a lot of victories. He has learned to care deeply for each one of these men. And he's concerned about what's getting ready to happen to them. And in his prayer, he prays for their safekeeping. But he also commends their actions and their spirit. In effect, he gives thanks to God for them. But look who he's giving thanks for. First of all, there's Peter, an impetuous man who frequently let his mouth or his actions get into gear before his brain did, who sometimes acted on emotion without any thought. Soon he's going to cut off a guard's ear with a sword in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus is going to have to reattach it and calm Peter down. Peter is the one who had the great revelation from the Holy Spirit that Jesus is the Christ. But shortly, he's going to be denying Jesus three times. What a turkey! How about James and John, the sons of Zebedee? Here they are asking Jesus for places of honor and uh, arguing among themselves about who is the greatest. When it comes to being disciples of Jesus, these two, let's face it, were a couple of turkeys. This entire group has failings and human imperfections. This group with no Dale Carnegie course on how to win friends or influence people, no public speaking experience, and who are still having a great deal of trouble trying to understand all the things that Jesus has been trying to teach them for three years. This is the group that Jesus is about to leave with the responsibility of spreading the good news throughout the world. If turkeys are people that don't remotely fill the bill as square pegs and round holes or in round holes, then Jesus certainly got a bunch of turkeys for his disciples, didn't he? And yet, despite all of their mistakes, their rashness and brashness, impetuousness, self-centeredness and selfishness, their lack of faith and blindness, despite the fact that they were just a bunch of turkeys when it came to being disciples, Jesus loved them and he had faith in them. That's the thing that really gets me. 
He believed in them. Even when they were having a hard time knowing what to believe. And he uttered a beautiful and genuine prayer for a bunch of turkeys. He didn't pray for better equipped disciples. He didn't pray for replacements. He just gave God thanks for the people God had given him. Sometimes I think we need to remember that. Uh, Whenever you were sitting around the... uh, a uh, table this last Thanksgiving, you may have been sitting there wondering, now, how did I wind up in this family? Who are these people? You know, it's sometimes it's just kind of, we just wind up kind of at odds in a way and feeling like we don't even belong with the people that are sitting around the table with us. And yet these are the people that God has given us. And one of the things that I'm always thankful for are the people that God brings into my life because every one of them is there for a reason. And we need to be grateful for those people that God has placed us in contact with all the way up and down. He gave thanks to God for the ones that God had entrusted to him. Sometimes it was one step forward and two steps back, but mostly it was two ahead and one back, and they got the job done. But what does all this tell us? I think the most important message is that we here at San Philip United Methodist Church need to follow Jesus' example of being thankful for the people that we have around us in this room today and Sunday to Sunday and the people that we have around us at home as well. You know, in some churches, and I've heard of these things I'm getting ready to share with you. I've heard in different churches I've served. Some churches, the plea goes up. Oh, Lord, we've only got a bunch of turkeys here, square pegs and round holes. How do you expect us to get the job done? Preachers are often guilty of this. If we only had more dedicated Christians like John and Mary Doe, maybe this church wouldn't be in so much trouble. Stewardship persons or chairpersons are are known to say, if we only had more 10% tithers and fewer dollar tippers, we'd be so much better off. Choir directors have been known to say or think or tell God, If we only had more trained voices in the choir, we could sing better and our music could be so much more inspirational. Women's groups are always saying, if we only had younger women, we could get so much more done. Folks, Jesus didn't look to God for replacements and he didn't send people back to God for an exchange, did he? What he did do was he gave God humble thanks for the turkeys that God had given him out of the world, for the ill-fitting square pegs who had to do round hole jobs. Now, we've just gone through our recruitment for this next year where uh, you were probably approached, uh, if you remember the church, with uh, how they were hoping that you would serve our church in the year ahead. And some of you don't feel worthy of serving God in any capacity, but because you feel like you're just a turkey that just doesn't fit that square peg in the round hole. And yet you're the one that he's called to get the job done in the year that is ahead. And you can know that God's going to help you to get it done. We don't need to be replaying. We don't need to be praying for replacements because we have you. He has you. And he is putting you exactly where you need to be at this point in time. You know, I was thinking about this and I remembered this cross that uh, uh, we have over there. And I think it pretty well speaks to what I'm talking about today. I put that cross together myself. 
There's no nails holding it together. Those nails that you see there, y'all put there, they're representing your sin, the sin that Jesus died on the cross to pay for. Every one of those nails represents a life that's been washed and cleansed by the precious blood of Jesus. Uh, it's held together by tension. Did you know that the two members, there's no nails, like I said, it's just held together by friction and tension, and it holds together very well. The first time I did a cross like that, I bought a big bolt to put through it and to bolt it together. And then whenever I got it together, it didn't move. And it was because of the imperfections between the two, in, in the, the two members that they grabbed and they held. Now this one, it kind of got messed up a little bit because, uh, I made the, so the whole, I wasn't shooting per, for perfection this time. When I shot per, for, for perfection, the imperfections held it together. But I was a little bit more careless on this one. And so there's some wedges driven in there to help it hold together. But they're wooden wedges made out of the same material as the cross itself. But the thing is, this reminds us that Jesus didn't come for a bunch of perfect people. He doesn't entrust getting his job done in the world today to perfect people. The church exists because we are all imperfect, because we all have our faults and we all have uh, our, our different things that just aren't right with us. And the thing that holds us all together is the love of Jesus. And the thing that helps us to get the job done is the fact that he helps us to get it done. The thing that whenever the, the passage that we read earlier today, Paul was feeling so inadequate for the job that he had because of the thorn in the flesh. And he asked the Lord to remove it. And I just love what Paul was told by the Lord because there's so many times I've had to remind myself of this. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. When I am feeling the most inadequate, when I'm feeling the most turkey-like, I remember this passage and remember that God loves to take just the wrong person to get the right job done. So don't be telling him, no matter what the challenge is before you, that you're not the right one for the job. People have tried that before. Remember Moses? Moses said, but Lord, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm slow of speech and I, I, I stutter and, and whatever else, you know. He said, Moses, don't worry about it. I'll be with you. I'll, you can take your brother along with you if you want to. You don't need to, but you may as well. So, Moses had excuses. Jeremiah, he said, but Lord, people aren't going to listen to me. I'm just a kid. The Lord didn't say, oh yeah, Jeremiah, what was I thinking? You know, that's not what he did, was it? Instead, he said, do not say to me, I am but a youth. You go where I send you and I will be with you and people are going to listen to you. And then we hear, we've got Paul here. Paul who felt so inadequate sometimes. Paul who, they say that his preaching wasn't all that great. That, uh, I remember there was one time, I can't remember the guy's name, Paul preached so long. I better stop saying. Anyway, Paul preached so long that there was a, a kid sitting in the window and upstairs and he fell asleep fell out the window and died. 
Did y'all ever read that story? Nobody ever preaches about that. I guess it's because preachers don't want that sort of thing called to everybody else's attention. But uh, so Paul goes down <laughs> and he prays for the this guy, this young man, and the young man winds up uh, coming back to life. And so uh, had a great ending there to a, a long and boring sermon. But uh, and I'm sure everybody was awake after all that was over. But the thing is, is that uh, Paul many times was criticized. Many times uh, he felt inadequate. Gideon felt so inadequate. Just just look through scripture and you'll find person after person. And that brings us to today. And the fact that when Jesus prayed for that bunch of turkeys back there, he put a clause in there to include you. Have you noticed that? Where it says, I don't pray just for these guys right here, but also for everyone who's going to come to know you, Heavenly Father, through what they say about you and me. And that includes you and that includes me. So whenever Jesus was praying that prayer, he himself prayed for you along with all those other turkeys. And so when you're feeling like a square peg, trying to fit in a round hole. Remember that that's where God is glorified in making that work. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.